Well, hello everyone. I hope you enjoyed your coffee uh, and welcome to this uh, next session. Now, as far as I'm aware, all the um, previous sessions have been a general overview of the TV landscape. I wasn't here to see them, I'm afraid. And about content, the need to be global, and the effects of Brexit, which I did hear some of, actually. What I'm interested in in Brexit is the fact that when we covered it last year on uh, Mock the Week, it wasn't even called Brexit, it was called Brixit, which is just a different conflation of the same words. And I'm very glad they moved away from that, because Brixit to me just sounds like a new type of Lego, or, uh, or what the Greek finance minister does every time he meets Angela Merkel. <laughs> so that's, um, that's very good. Th this, this particular session, though, is all about the changing nature of TV consumption, hence the title, you don't own a TV, what do you point your furniture at? In other words, with so many different ways of consuming TV, what are we expecting consumers to do? Who watches what, when, and how? And, and particularly for you know, people with families, will this next generation of children who WhatsApp while they're watching telly and texts and do all sorts of stuff at the same time, ever be able to concentrate? That's my, that's my biggest. Thing. Are certain demographics being left behind? What does it mean for linear? How does any of it get monetized? And is there too much content? But before we get into any of this, I made a short video. Watching telly used to be so easy. Four channels, maybe five, and everyone watched the same thing in the same place at the same time, unless your family was at the cutting edge of technology and had a video recorder. But now, it's impossible. It's coming at me from everywhere, on everything. You can watch any episode of anything, anytime, anywhere, and it is doing my head in. And anything I want to watch is being ruined by people who seem to have more free time than I have. I want to have a normal conversation with people in which I don't have to go, no! Don't tell me the end, because I haven't seen that yet. I don't want people to look at me pitifully when I say, making a murderer? What's that about? So, I've locked myself in here. I've got enough food to last me for a couple of months. I have all the devices, and I'm not coming out until I have watched everything. I want to be a fully functioning member of society again. Wish me luck. Well, it's all going pretty well so far. Just watched four series back to back of a subtitled Scandi political drama. Not 100% sure what it was about, to be honest. It's either a searing indictment to capitalism or it's 48 hours of a man sitting in a darkened room deciding whether to upgrade his iPhone. Either way, I'm now streaming in Danish. I haven't got round to making a murder yet. Tuck. Still haven't got on to making a murderer, but uh, as an educational bonus, my Spanish has improved. La heroína es malo, Pablo. Que va a morir. The heroine is bad, Pablo. You'll die. It's quite specific Spanish. Still, can't get enough of narcos. So, a slightly weird day today. I uh, accidentally watched an advert I haven't seen one for forever. It was very odd. OK, I'd been resisting it, but today I, I gave in and it turns out that everyone was right. I mean, it is fantasy, but it is addictive. There, there's violence, there's lies, there's deceit, there's loads of boobs. And, and sometimes you're just left open mouthed at the audacity of it. And now I've caught up with the American election. I'm going to watch Game of Thrones. I went on YouTube today. I like leaving comments on the cat videos, so sue me. Anyway, it turns out that YouTube also make TV shows now, so I have to watch those too. What next? 50 hours of free television when you order a tin of beans, eh? So, I ordered these beans from Amazon Prime. Turns out I do get 50 hours of free television with a tin of beans. I'm never getting out of here.
I've done it. Finished. It's done. I've watched everything. No one can spoil anything for me now. Finally got round to watching Making a Murderer. What happens in the end is that... Thank you. <clears throat> so there you go. And uh, to help us, through, you know, find our way through the new landscape of telly, uh, we have, going from far sides to near side, Ben McCohen Wilson, who's the director of YouTube EMEA, formerly of ITV. I, I read an article that you wrote about the Nike Switch ad, uh, where Ronaldo careers into a, a small child, and they change personalities in a sort of Boris Johnson kind of collision, playing rugby <laughs> kind of way. Um, which might be the new way for advertising on, on TV, which is interesting. Simon Pitts, who is the managing director online at ITV, also used to work in the European Parliament on media issues. That's not a career choice, which is going to be open to anyone now, of course. <laughs> um, uh, Jim Ryan, Chief Strategy Officer of Liberty Global, the world's largest international TV and broadband company, whose company motto is connect, discover, be free. Although I don't think being free is part of their financial strategy. <laughs> uh, owners of Virgin Media and formerly PwC and Deutsche, so you come at it from a, a business background. And finally, Sue Uniman of uh, Mediacom, and you're the chief strategy officer. You buy and plan media. And uh, a thing that I read that you said was that consensus is the last thing that you need in your business. Uh, and I'm hoping we won't have consensus today, frankly, because that will make for a much more interesting session. Before we uh, start, though, perhaps we should look at the data that we're, uh, we're covering and that we're talking about. And so just a couple or three or four slides. Now, the first one is um, that platform operators... Uh, we know this already, continue to innovate and grow. So there's nothing, nothing at all new about that, but it just is talking about the rise of different, different platforms. Uh, the decline of TV viewing to the TV set is uh, easing in the UK, which is, um, I don't know whether that's good news or bad news. It's great news for television set manufacturers, I suppose. Um, but it doesn't show what they're watching. I suppose if you've got a smart TV... Um, you could be watching anything. My son said, if our TV was really smart, he would know not to watch Homes Under the Hammer. Um, <laughs> younger audiences are watching less TV in a lower proportion live than older audiences. Younger viewers, TV watching is forecast to decline, but stabilise in the period to 2020. And finally, that being said, more than 80% of all UK video viewing is to broadcaster content. So my first question, really, to uh, all of you, are those the key trends? Do you, do, does anyone see any other trends which we've missed out there? Well, what, what we're really not measuring properly is how much television is being viewed on other devices. Now, there's research metrics that are coming our way in that respect, but it's not standardised. And my gut feel is, is that probably an 18-year-old now is actually watching more television than you were when you were 18, because you were just out. I was watching nothing when yeah. I was 18. So that's the, yeah. so, so even a little bit be more. Um, I was working yeah. extremely hard. <laughs> um. but also, I mean, young people, still, I know it's not a fashionable thing to say, but young people still watch lots of mainstream telly. So the biggest shows on telly for, for, for young people are X Factor, Bake Off, Britain's Got Talent. They get 65% shares of 16 to 34s. Coronation Street gets a 35% share of 16 to 34s. There are lots of dedicated programs for young people too. Uh, a good example uh, that I would cite uh, is Love Island uh, this year. Um, uh, bigger than Big Brother, 1.3 million people watched it overnight. 75% of all the audience were, were uh, 16 to 24. Another 30 million uh, long-form catch-up views, a million a day. But we shouldn't kid ourselves. I mean, young people aren't going to wake up one morning and turn into their parents instantly. Um, they're watching TV in a very different way. And as Sue says, um, it's all about multi-device, a bit less live, a bit more VOD. And that's why people like us are spending so much money developing video on demand services. Okay, but you, you rely, don't you, on... Well, I, I, confession here. So when, before I became 
an actor of sorts, um, I was in marketing. So I worked for Unilever as a brand manager. So I, I made ads and I, I placed ads and I did brand manager of links. Slightly embarrassing. Anyway, um, I'm responsible for the smell in your children's bedrooms. Anyway, um, and we were always taught that, that, that getting younger viewers was really key to keeping a brand going you know, forever. You had to get them young. And younger, there is a fall off, isn't there? There's definitely a fall off in younger TV viewing. So is that fatal for your model? Is that fatal for the advertising industry? No, I mean, it just means you have to work harder to get, to get hold of them. So you have to get content to them in very different ways. We've, and others, not just us, have spent a long time and lots of money developing video on demand services that target younger people as well as, as, well as all mainstream viewers. So we've got, we don't shout about it too much, but we've got 16 million registered users of the ITV Hub, and including in that number over half of all uh, 16 to 24 year olds in the country. Uh, most of our viewing on the Hub is. 16 to 34s and not other demographics. So if you get the shows right and you put them in the right place where people want them, young people still watch telly. Okay, and do you... It's, it's got more is that right? Yes, <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's got more complicated to reach 16 to 24 year olds than it was in your day. So it's, it's a, a trickier You're thing You're thinking to... I'm more than 24, that's the <laughs> thing. Yeah. Four or five years ago, yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it's, y you've got to bring more analysis to it, more skill to it, you've got to look at data in a different way. The other difference is, is that you need more formats. So one of the cliches of the TV industry is content is king, if content is king, format is queen. Because serving the same 30 second ad that you might have made for links on television on a YouTube channel that's being watched by a 16 to 24 year old man isn't necessarily the right thing to do, ditto Facebook, ditto possibly video on demand. However, the opportunity to get it right and make it tailored and even personalized is huge and amazing. And I think we're sitting at the brink of sort of the disruptors and the, and the disrupted coming together and creating a new ecosystem, different forms of generating revenue, different ways of reaching consumers, more complicated, but not necessarily less profitable. And do manufacturers and your clients agree with you? Yes, they, so, they so are. absolutely. They're taking, taking that on board. So if we take an advertiser like um, Coca-Cola, who obviously wants to reach 16, 24 years as well, we've done some brilliant personalized um, video on demand advertising with uh, Channel 4 where the bottle came up with your name on it if you um, watched it on uh, the ad on mm -hmm. Channel 4. And equally, some great activity with Snapchat. So it's just about thinking about things in the same sort of empirical fashion, what works, what doesn't work, but also trying more new ways. I think what I, what I don't necessarily see is that um, content producers are coming to media agencies and advertisers in the way that we would like them to with ideas, actually. And uh, Jim, you, uh, Liberty Global is mainly, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's mainly a cable yep. firm. Yeah. Isn't it? And you've got yeah. Virgin Media here, etc. Yeah. Now, do you do you care about younger viewers? Thirty-five percent of UK cable households have got SVOD as well. So presumably, an SVOD consumption skews the young. <laughs> so, are you worried in your model that when those younger viewers get their own packages, they just won't bother with cable? Content. Uh, it's why would they, why would they stick <laughs> with cable when they can get everything they want elsewhere? Uh, funnily enough, it's probably exactly the opposite, which is the environment that's being generated now makes, makes what we offer all the more important. I think there was a stat, I think it was last year, YouGov stat, there's seven, it, it's a year old, but there were seven connected devices per home. Um, so that means every day we're connecting 35 million devices, <coughs> all of which are obviously capable of viewing content. And I think... Um, you know, as, as the content producers want to reach into the deeper demographics, it's not an either or, it's a both. So one person, you know, you and me, will be watching location, location, location in, in HD in the living room, but the kids are going to be up in the bedroom watching whatever they want to watch. And I think um, there's two things that we really focus on in order to enhance the experience, which is a 360 degree, because the best way of ruining good content is by either not being able to see it at all, or the buffering, or rendering it poorly, or not being able to find it. So I think that um, the fact that there's all these devices now, um, it's sort of like 
It's the sort of oxymoron of personalized aggregation, where we're trying to aggregate in one place what individual people want to watch. And I think that's very much what, what we're but trying is to that, deliver. But, Forgive me, but that isn't quite what's happening in the States, is it? Isn't there, uh, isn't there in the States, people are, I forget what the phrase is, cutting the cord, isn't it? Whereby cable subscriptions are falling because people have... Well, I think there's things. two Why things. Why won't we, that happen in the we, we UK? We look quite carefully at that. Um, and I think there's not 40 million people cutting the cable cords, let's be crystal clear. So, you know, the evolution of SVOD is not cord cutting. It may have an impact on which incremental services a home selects. But I think there's a, a more fundamental thing, which is if you look at cable in the US now, it's probably costing you nearly $1,500 a year. And there's just the 101 demand curve of affordability, which is as you get up to these toppy levels, some households just can't afford it. They're, they're going to have to trade off how they spend their money. In Europe, we're not even close to those levels. And on our subscriber base, what we see is a high level of complementarity between the customers who want to have the richest possible entertainment um, environment and they are the ones who have a higher propensity to add on the Netflixes or services such as that. So we find that, you know, in the UK, we were, we were probably first out of the game. The UK, Tom's here, um, with, with the Netflix uh, service on our, on our platform. And those customers have highest propensity to watch, happiest MPS, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, you know, it's, it's not as simplistic as, as, as people say, which is either you take OTT and you're clearly going to cut your cable cord, or you take you're a dinosaur because yeah. you're still connected but to it cable. But it will be at some point. Because, but when to, you know, if we go into a recession or... No, I, don't, I, don't, I think it's quite the opposite because what we're seeing, I mean, every day we now have 7 million what we call next-gen users, and they're taking our all-enhanced platform, which has... We now offer to our subscribers replay, catch-up, 100 channels on the go that you can watch in the house, out of the house. Mm -hmm. And the subscribers taking that is growing every day. So actually, we're clearly offering something that people want, which is not just the content but everything around it. OK. And, but Ben, your, your problem at YouTube is, the, is sort of the opposite, isn't it? In that you have loads and loads and loads of, of young viewers. What are your plans to retain them as they grow up? Or do we assume that? You know, I guess um, I'm not sure I'd ever phrase it as a, as a problem. I think, uh, first of all, um, <laughs> we've got lots and lots of all people. We've got uh, globally over a billion people every month coming to the platform and the vast majority of those people coming every day to the platform. And uh, that means we're touching all audiences. It's definitely true that the trend in terms of how people consumed has impacted the younger audiences more rapidly than it's impacting others. But I think that is what we would term a, as a tailwind. Right? That's something, it will be more true in five years' time than it is today that people will be choosing to watch uh, on demand and the technology is going to get better and better at making that easier for people to make, make those choices. Already, one of, the, one of the elements, one of the trends we haven't talked about here is, is the emergence of other devices. You know, for us, mobile is already over 60% of all of our consumption here in the, in the UK, and that's as true for older audiences as it is for younger audiences, because now, versus three, four years ago, all of us have a device in our pocket that's capable of playing back uh, HD moving images, and where most of us will be subscribing, whether it's to gym services or a mobile phone operator services, something that allows us to play that content back. And that will only be more true for more people in the UK and more people around the world in, in five years' time. I think what's interesting, so, so, so if, the, if the how is, the, is following an inevitability pushed by, by global technical, uh, technological tailwinds, the more interesting question is, is kind of how much is what people are changing, uh, viewing, uh, changing. And we've heard that <clears throat> from some of the panels earlier today, and we definitely see that on our platform. And we see uh, partners here in the UK and in other markets adapting the way in which they deliver their content, uh, how they use our platform to seed clips. If you look at, um, in, in North America, if you look at the US chat show hosts, every single one of them is using YouTube essentially as a massive tune-in device a uh, massive yeah. daily tuning campaign. If you look at what James Corden's done, everybody in the room will be familiar with Carpool Karaoke. You will have seen that first on our, on our platform. If you've seen celebrities read mean tweets, you will have seen that first on our, on our platform. And, and that's the change in the, not just the how we're watching, but the what we're watching. And that's smart media companies adapting to the way that okay. technology is just changing. So, and this is the first word I ever learned in marketing. They are synergistic, <laughs> synergistic. Um, YouTube and the other platforms. 
But what interests me then is because it does seem to me that kind of getting people young is very important. And I know we've talked about um, drama in earlier sessions, but I, I, I don't understand that, that sort of conflict, really, in that those are the people you want to get and keep, and yet everything seems to be a battle of big US drama. So, I mean, it, and it gives you a sort of a slight sense of, oh, am I missing something all the time? Because there are all these things on all the time. Now, why, why is that? Why, why? So, for example, in the US, Jim, basic cable has sort of tripled um, original series in the past five years. So there are now gritty things like um, Mr. Robot. On. Now, why? Does that work? Yeah, I mean, you know, the... the the world is sort of bifurcating a little bit into the sort of what broadcasters need to show for primetime viewing and what pay TV platforms are trying to attract. Um, I can't remember. There's a, the sort of the fanatical 5% or whatever who are going to be going after these gritty dramas. And I think that, you know, the fact that there's more... And, because the, the, in every hour of video sort of 20 years ago, you could only go to one screen to watch that. Hours. So the eyeball hours, if you had six people in the house, uh, three people in the house, you had six eyeball hours focusing on one screen. Now, of course, everyone has their own screen. So you've got two eyeball hours per screen times three screens, but they don't all want to watch the same stuff. So therefore, the idea that you're going to be filling it with storytelling, which is really the scripted drama thing, makes a ton of sense. And, if, and I think that's absolutely... If the question is, Hugh, whether that sort of investment model in, in drama is sustainable, I mean... It, you must question that, really. I mean, there's so many new dramas every year. It's fantastic for producers. We're one of them. That's our strategy. But not everyone in the States is going to be able to do an AMC and turn themselves from a you know, repeat movie channel into the home of must-have original drama. Not everyone will be able to do it. Everyone's trying at the moment, but there will be some who fall by the wayside. The read across to the UK is a little bit more difficult because... Not everyone is watching US box set drama. They, they love box sets. They love the convenience of box sets. But they love watching UK stuff too. Most of the viewing well, is still to, to UK drama. The, the big US SVODs aren't investing very much, if anything, in, in UK drama. And our challenge is making sure our drama, 150 new hours a year on ITV, gets everywhere, is in box set form, not just linear form. So you think there is a limited appetite for US drama for a UK audience. I mean, I, 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 quite often, it's great for actors in the same way as it's great for producers because there's so many opportunities, but it is kind of weird when you see Rufus Sewell doing an American accent to play a Nazi. Coming, yeah. <laughs> you're thinking, well, you know, it, it's, it's sort of odd, but it does... Well, they're generating less ratings. So, so yeah. I mean, that, in terms of fact, they're generating less ratings. But I also, I really want to say that it's not all about 16, 24 year olds as well. I mean, the, the, the economic power of, uh, in this yeah. country is outside gaming is wielded by women over the age of 40 who do like a bit of drama <clears throat> and who do like to, uh, advertisers like to attract and to associate with. Okay. It might be unfashionable to say but that. But you can't, no, I'm sure that's absolutely right. But you, the other problem it strikes me that you have with drama, unlike comedy, is that you can't repeat drama. So comedy goes on and on and on and on and on, as I know, because I've made the same joke for the last <laughs> 30 years. But, you, but drama is almost unrepeatable. You can't repeat drama. What Tell that mean? to the, yeah. the, the person who runs ITV3 at our place. <laughs> uh, you, you can repeat But what drama. ratings do you get on it? But, Fantastic but ratings. Do you get a million viewers a night on, on, uh, on, on dramas that have been out maybe five or ten years? Um, there is a huge amount of drama. I mean, people love... US drama. There's no doubt about that. There is a phenomenon going on. Yeah. But people in the UK love UK drama even more. Um, and our challenge is to make sure we get it in front of them. We're the ones who are investing in original drama in this, uh, along with Sky and the other PSBs. Our challenge isn't that we need to make more of it, it's that we need to make it available on the terms that everyone, the audience, want to consume it. Because they're not watching it all live. So if you take a you know, Game of Thrones, only 10% of the first episode's audience was to the first episode viewing live, and the rest of it was uh, video on demand or repeats. Um, so it's the, the whole idea of what the audience wants when they want it, and you have to deliver that, and then you have to monetize it. It is, it is a challenge, but it's not that there isn't any money or any audience. And is that what are YouTube doing about drama? Are you, are you making... So, so no, we're, um, our position's very different. We're trying to make sure that we've got a, 
a platform that uh, over time can ensure that all content can find its audience from any, any creator on the planet, whether that's a professional producer or drama studios or a broadcaster, or people out on the football field showing kids how to take free kicks or do tricks, or people in their bedroom showing people how to do uh, makeup or, or other tips. Um, our goal is to ensure that any piece of content can find its home. That means, for sure, there's some content that doesn't come to us on, our, on its first window or doesn't come in its full-length form on its first window. Um, but there's plenty of content that does come in that way. So whether that's uh, clips, whether that's the fan-created uh, series around Game of Thrones, whether that's John Oliver or James Gordon looking to build a, a global audience to onward syndicate those shows uh, internationally, we're perfectly happy to work with traditional media creators in whatever window and whatever capacity they, they think is right. Okay. Um, and we're happy, by the way, to work with YouTube too. You, you, you suggested that Ben might have a problem with 16 to 24s because it's just young people on his platform. If there's a problem, it's that there isn't yet a very clear business model for making money out of platforms like YouTube mm. and Facebook. Unless you are YouTube or Facebook, or, or, or Ben personally. And it's, yeah. not that, it's not that, um, and it's not that they're not fantastic platforms and very powerful and very influential. And boy, do we try to use the power of Facebook and, and, uh, and YouTube to drive audiences, as you said, to our channels. And we're doing a lot there. But it's not clear um, how content providers and broadcasters are going to get a bang for their buck on, on, on content on, on the platform, given lots and lots of payaways. We reckon if you have a million views on YouTube, you make $5,000. So scale is everything. Even if you have 100 million views, that doesn't change your life. It's not, again, that the platform isn't fantastic and doesn't have great potential, but there isn't a business model there for long form that we can see yet. OK. I think, if I can just come back on I think, first of all... I think you'd better. I think I'd better. Um, yeah, I think, first of all, there are lots of our partners for whom uh, there's a pretty good business model. There are value for plenty of independent producers who will be here in the uh, audience today for whom, you know, who hard fought in 2003 to retain clip rights uh, against pressure from the broadcasters and have made meaningful, uh, many of them, uh, seven digit sums over the years with us as a platform distributing those rights uh, globally as clips in markets and making international sales on the back of them. There are people who are creating uh, original content, mm -hmm. albeit from a different price point in terms of the, the content that they're putting out there. And it's certainly not the same. It's not attracting the million dollar an hour spend or four million dollar an hour spend, I think Steve Burke mentioned earlier. Um, but there are people who are very definitely uh, building distribution businesses, building ad-funded businesses. And in Europe alone, we've got kind of tens of thousands of people, and that's the other pieces, tens of thousands of people who are now making uh, six-figure sums in terms of the revenues they're deriving on an annual basis. And that... We're a platform that is there, sure, for, hopefully for the big guys and for them to make a decision about when or if the right time is there to distribute long-form content. Okay. But we're absolutely there for the little guys as well. So that brings me on to another thought, really. I mean, the, the thing which is really changing in the TV landscape is the fact that uh, ultimately, possibly, there might be no schedule. Right? So you just go and get stuff where you want it, when you want it. And I, and I wonder how much a schedule matters. I mean, it, it really matters to Radio Times, for whom it is an absolute disaster, <laughs> obviously. But how much does it matter to uh, anyone else? How important is that structure? And I'm kind of thinking that, Jim, for you, it is important, and as is live TV, because you have just paid, whatever it is, eight billion pounds for Formula One. Now, why, why have you done that? Um, it was our cousins. Okay, the media who, bought, okay. who bought Formula One. Nothing to do Probably with you. nothing yeah. to do with us, I'm afraid. Um, I think there's two things. I mean, we've been sort of conducting uh, surveys to try and understand what is the trajectory of the individual. I'm sure you must be doing it in way more detail than us. But what you see is you see a definite dip in the consumption of total video as when you're a student, probably because working hard at Cambridge in the library. Um, through well, my nickname, actually, to be honest, was Desk at the <laughs> university. Slightly alarming. Anyway, yeah. carry on. Um, it's, it's more flattering than mine, I won't tell you mine. Um, and, um, and then it sort of picks up a bit as you go through flat sharing. 
And then actually, by the time you're back into families, whether it's under 25, over 25s, um, you're not quite back at the sort of, the sort of non-millennials, if you will, but it's getting back up there. But what's happening is obviously what you're viewing is changing slightly. And, and we do see a trend that the absolute amount of hours spent on you know, TV, short name being live TV, has reduced. But it still has the overwhelming market share. I mean, it's, it's a huge percentage, albeit of a smaller number. And so I think what drives that is obviously the, the sort of the comfort that the individual takes, that there's some sort of control and editing going on of the quality of the programming that's going to be going out with that. And obviously behind that comes the advertising. I think a lot of the question about where is it, where is it all going to end up is a matter of um, money, which is clearly if, if, if the money chases that kind of aggregation and that kind of aggregation allows the high quality, then that's a self-fulfilling Prophecy, if you look over, I mean, I've been following the OTT space for 15 years now. Funny enough, we, had a, we have what we call a disruptive forum once a year. And we looked at all the things we've followed over the last 10 years. Three quarters of them are gone. They're tombstones now. Because they weren't able to sustain the model. The funding didn't follow the cost of delivering that type of quality mm. programming. The, the broadcasting still can. So I think there'll be a balancing, there'll be a preto equilibrium hit where, where um, well, the, the multiple opportunities of finding content will balance out with the cost of providing good quality because people still want good quality and that's expensive. And the EPGs, I mean, it's still very important, right? It's not the only way to drive people to, to, to channels and programs, but it's still very important and the, sh the schedule is still very important. I mean, ask, you know, ask the people that are uh, spending lots, lots of money bidding for EPG slots on Sky. Ask BBC Three, given the impact of losing a scheduled spot on the EPG, apart from your show, obviously, which has bucked all trends and is massive fleabag. Yeah, I was trying done to, well fleabag. Yeah, done really well. Um, I'm not really like that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, I find the most interesting thing is when you look at these massive youth entertainment companies like Vice, the poster child, mm. Of, of, of young media, what is the big growth strategy for Vice? Launching a linear TV channel in the UK and across the world. Um, and if you talk to these digital first guys, and, and there are lots of very talented formats being created on YouTube and other platforms, one of the first things they say is that they would like a route to TV because that's where they get mass market exposure. But at the moment, sorry, at the moment, you have a, you have a protected space on the EPG, don't you? So you're, you're there automatically in the top. For our linear channel, we get yeah. prominence. So what happens when that goes? Well, it won't, because it's a license requirement for the next 10 years or so. Um, so in 11 years, what happens? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll all be getting TV via our fridges and direct to our brains yeah. by that point. No, no look, it's, it, prominence is very important and still will be, but it's not just prominence of linear channels anymore. It's prominence for your apps. So we care about where our apps appear on the home pages of... You view or a Samsung connected and TV you can control. Can you control that? Is it you can? Some, sometimes, if we have a stake or? in the platform, we have we have more influence, and sometimes we don't, frankly. And it's a commercial negotiation, but it really is only one of many ways now to drive people to watch live TV, and and that's why having a proper direct relationship with your viewers, registered users who you know and who know you, allows you to do more things, allows you to introduce personalization, recommendations. If you've never watched an episode of Coronation Street and you go onto the ITV hub and you're bombarded with Coronation Street steals, that's not a good use of your time. If you're a okay. big Cory fan, you want to see it. We'd, we'd like to move to more of that okay. world. In the, in the new world of television where Amazon, who deliver parcels, can have a a television channel because it seems like a good way, a good synergy between the two. What, it's a good word, isn't it? I'm going to use that more, I think, in my normal life. What is, what is to stop, this is really for you, Sue, what is to stop manufacturers, say Unilever or, you know, Procter & Gamble, starting their own television channels? Mm. Is there any benefit in that at all? Well, I think we've seen a wave of brands saying that they want to be broadcasters and content owners. We've seen Red Bull be quoted time and time again as the exception because they threw somebody out of a space rocket and got big audience for that, and they are investing a lot in content. I think most brand manufacturers that I am aware of 
in terms of numbers of them, there are some prominent ones who don't agree, but most of them agree that their business is to compete with other people who are making soap powders or other people who are making you know, deodorants rather than broadcasters and content owners. Um, but, but having said that, I'm, I'm sure we will see a bit more of that. I, I think the, the question will be, what's the return on investment? Um, and we, the UK is still a very traditional market. I, I really would observe that. I mean, even if a programme moves from BBC One to Channel Four, the, and I'm not mentioning any names here, the audience will drop simply because it's moved from 101 to 104. I mean, that's extraordinary if, if you take the Sky EPG. We're not asking people to go onto the second page of it. It's just press the 10, you know, even from BBC One to BBC Two or the other way around, as you know, from two to one, the audience automatically grows. There's a lot of risk averseness in TV, and there's still a lot of people. So there are lots of people who are obviously looking for content when and where they want it. And then there's those of us that just want to watch what's on the telly. And I think Thinkbox um, showed me some research the other uh, week that's a really interesting uh, question, which is that it's not about enjoying watching TV content or any content via mobile, via iPad, via laptop. It's the question of who's in control of the television in the sitting room. And when you're 18, you're not in control. And when you're 30, you are in control. And so how much behavior will change because of the different ways people have been watching content when they're 18 is an interesting question. Or do you, will you just go back to, I'm going to, I've had a hard day at work, I'm sitting down, I'm putting my feet up, and I want to watch some content that one of the big channels is providing for me? The thing which, is, which worries me slightly about <coughs> the fact that people watch telly on their own and all the rest of it, and you can, is that you, know, you expect the model to change when they have families but you wonder whether they're ever going to be sociable enough to actually have families. <laughs> uh, that's there. The other thing that I, I find interesting about the schedule is, is whether... Uh, the, the schedule is very useful for creativity because you were able to, uh, to protect things, hide things, move things, do all the rest of it. If you've got this model now which, which demands that you get people to your platform by producing Man in the High Castle or narcos or whatever. How, how is creativity protected? So I think on, on our platform, we absolutely don't have, there is no 9 p.m. slot. I can't hammock you between uh, two other shows. And that's both a massive challenge to people who've come from, from that world, but it's a huge opportunity as well for people to, uh, as we found, build their own audiences, very often starting small. The first, yeah, some of our biggest creators on the platform today will speak about moments when they had a thousand subscribers or their videos were getting hundreds of views a day rather than hundreds of millions of views a day. And for them, the purity, which I think actually would be something that would be true for program makers within the world of traditional television, is make something, don't make something for a big audience, make something for an audience who love what you're making and start from there. And what technology allows today is that conversation to, to grow and grow. So creators like John Green will write a book like Fault in Their Stars and it will skyrocket to uh, number one in the charts all around the world or they'll make a movie and it will make 300 million off a base of 15 million. But he'd already read that book to his fans on YouTube as a developing novel. And he'd got an yeah. audience that had less than a million subscribers, and he'd read every chapter to them. And they, there had been there are comments still there today where you can see well, how that developed. YouTube goes on. really stands or falls on the creativity of the contributors, doesn't it? And also on the on the creativity of the advertisers in a way. But how how will ITV, how does Liberty Global protect creativity? Well, I mean, creativity is in our DNA for a start. And as a as a as a as a, as a producer broadcast, I mean, that's our our entire strategy over the last few years has been to make make more sh more shows that uh, we can uh, sell around the world. And I, I don't think, you know, when you when you ask producers what, about their experience with the new SVODs, because these new guys aren't steeped in making shows and commissioning shows, and there's no algorithm for a TV hit, we talk about data all the time as informing creative decisions. I think that's slightly overplayed. I think the new guys rely much more on um, the, the commissioning teams, the production talent um, that have been doing it for many years to bring their creativity to them. And that's why there's never been a better time to be a producer of content in the UK or elsewhere, because the number of buyers is, frankly, bigger than it's ever been. There's more change coming, though, isn't there? 
when, when I can tell my Amazon Echo just to find me something to, that I'll enjoy watching, does that change everything again? I think if, if, if the question what you're asking is, can, you know, is the world, is there enough money in the world to sustain all the creativity needed to keep, to keep delivering? I think it sort of little, it bifurcates a little bit. I mean, we find, I mean, it's not surprising SVOD, YouTube, all that is, <coughs> is highly used because it's free or really, really cheap. And, um, you know, if you look at the success of direct-to-consumer SVOD today, there aren't, the ones that survive profitability is mysterious. Um, and there's many, many who haven't survived. And there's clearly a huge amount of price sensitivity. The demand curve for that product is, you know, you saw what happened when Netflix put a dollar on their pricing. Um, so I think for it to stand alone on its own has had its challenges. I think how you measure it and all that kind of yes. stuff as well. That but hasn't when you, helped. That hasn't helped. But when you put it in a bundle the way, you know, the, the cable industry is going, the pay TV industry is doing, where it's actually, don't worry about how much it costs. It's all part of what, of what you consume. It's actually hugely appreciated. I mean, you know, we have, I don't know, if, where we launch Replay TV, for instance. I mean, there's a reason why so many people like local TV. It's where a lot of the, we haven't really talked very much today about localized content against the global. Mm. There's content that travels globally. Mm. But the reason so many people still watch in Europe the localized channels is because the Slovakians want some of the stuff that's close to their heart. And the same with the Czechs, the Polish, the Swiss. And a lot of that creativity is coming from the broadcasters. It costs a lot of money. And so, it may, so even where we offer it all in a bundle, the majority of what's watched is either from those channels or associated with those channels through replay or catch up, et cetera. So I think the the balance is it has to be considered in its entirety. I think if you start segmenting the market and trying to make each individual slice of it profitable, that's where you start running into a bit of trouble. Okay. We're, we're also, as, a, as, uh, as ITV, we're, we're, we're not kind of sitting on our hands and thinking that we are the ones that have got the future of creativity. And our, we, you know, we're looking at, at platforms like YouTube and Facebook and others and are very excited, frankly, about what's happening there. Stealing the talent. The, well, the wanting. next generation of talent are emerging on those platforms, not yeah, just those platforms, great. other uh, other pay platforms too. And when you look at the content, maybe a few years ago it was Cats on Skateboards. It's not predominantly that anymore. It is content that looks more and more like TV. And there's lots, frankly, that you can learn too from these guys. They're doing it more cheaply. They, have, and they turn it around more quickly. They pilot more yeah, efficiently. Sure. Um, so what you're playing really effectively is that YouTube and people on YouTube, that you're right, that they do find a way of making the financial model work. Because unless, you, unless your model works, everybody else is stuck. We've, and we've, we have no, there is, uh, Simon's absolutely right, both in terms of in front of the camera and behind the camera, and, and the UK as much as any other market, we are a, an on-ramp for lots of people in terms of their creative talents. Uh, what's core for us is that those people remain on the platform as well. And for most of the YouTube talent, that's become central to uh, their definition of themselves as they go off and spin. There's uh, Humza Productions who've just done the BBC Three series. You know, they continued all of their uploads onto, um, onto YouTube as a platform. And I think yeah. it's absolutely not the case that we're a, a place just for, you can go and watch Cats on Skateboards if that's what you want, but the, the quality uh, the diversity and the range of talent okay. is one that's not paralleled in traditional media. We've got time, I think, for one more question. So I will make it a slightly provocative one. Looking at the, looking at the world, new world of television, <coughs> who's going to go bankrupt first? <laughs> Sue, you probably have that, quite a good that, view. Is that the people on the stage? Or? Well, it could be, yeah. So we'll um, answer it any way you want, really. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to... Uh, I think 2016 is a year when it's, uh, we've learned that it's bad to make predictions about what's going to happen because, uh, hey, who knows about anything. But what I would say is that anyone who isn't diversifying their income stream is, needs, needs, needs to wake up and smell the coffee because that's essential. We are diversifying how we uh, make money, how we uh, spend advertisers' budgets in ways that are, well, probably were unthought of even 10 years ago. And I think that, for me, is the big key, is try more than one thing. And expect some failure, but make sure that you work with agility to take risk and then build on what works. Well, you have to have strong content that ideally you own and a strong brand. 
And if you've got either one of those, you're in a reasonable place. And if you've got both, then you'll probably win. I think a business that has high fixed cost, um, which has been, for instance, the sort of the generic model around um, the sort of direct-to-consumer SVOD proposition, has historically not really worked out. So, but I don't think it's in anyone's interest. It's not in interest of the content producers, the studios, Universal, um, who are selling it to these people to distribute, to price it in a way that it will make them go bankrupt. So I think we'll probably move more into a model that allows greater flexibility in matching the cost and the revenue, rather than these extreme minimum guarantee, high fixed cost barriers, which then require an explosion of scale that's not happened and, uh, on, a, on a bespoke basis. So I think that will probably help amortize and land it. I think I'd start by saying that you know, if, if the pace of change feels scary now, it's only going to get faster. And I think, therefore, for all elements of the industry, what Steve Burke outlined this morning of that kind of, uh, I think he described it as being the challenge for anybody in, in, in our industry of trying to balance between extracting the value from the businesses that you've got today and innovating and investing in the future. Anybody who spends too much of their time on the former and not enough time on the latter is heading for trouble. Thank you. Well, that's, that's all we uh, have time for. I meant to remind you, you still have time to vote um, on Brexit. Seems a bit late to me. Um, <laughs> but anyway, you can. You go onto the app and you, you vote. You change history. It's amazing. It's sort of catch-up politics. Um, um, Next up, uh, we have an interview with someone who's charged with making sense of all this and maintaining the health and success of the UK TV sector, Ofcom Chief Executive Sharon White. But for now, can I please uh, thank Ben McCohen Wilson, Simon Pitts, Jim Ryan, and Sue Uniman, and you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>